If you haven't listened to the previous two episodes with Conley Owens, this episode won't have quite enough context to make sense. So go ahead and make sure to listen to those episodes before you continue with this one. Let's imagine that you've moved to a new town and you're looking for a church. You decide to visit the First Baptist Church nearby on Sunday morning. Upon arriving, you're directed to the entrance and told that you can purchase a ticket if you need one at the booth next to it. Although this sounds a bit strange, you walk up to the booth and are greeted by a cheerful lady. Hello, welcome to our church, and that'll be ten dollars, please. Uh, is this some kind of special fundraiser you're doing right now? Oh no, this is how it's always been. If you're wondering if there will be an offering, we'll take that inside. Huh, I've actually never paid to go to church before. Oh, well, we do have several options for people who can't afford the usual entry fee. First of all, you can see here, we have an option to pay by the month, which will save you 10%. And then, if you choose to pay for a whole year, you'll save 20%. That's the best deal! It also gives you premium benefits, such as access to the pastor's personal phone number, if you ever need any special prayer, as well as access to the more comfortable seats near the front of the sanctuary, access to our online catalog of sermons, and more. But if you'd rather do something else, we have a free plan that allows you to stand in the gallery, but you won't be able to participate in the Lord's Supper, or be involved in a small group, or any of the other things in the premium plan. Finally, we have a very reasonable option for those who can't afford these alternatives. From the comfort of your own home, you can stream the service for only 99 cents. It's really quite a good deal. So, what if I can't afford any of this, but I still want to participate fully in the services? Yes, that's a great question. We sometimes have these kinds of cases usually with immigrants. And we want to be radically generous with the resources God has given us. So we have a scholarship fund that can cover the cost of those who are approved. All you have to do is apply online and our scholarship committee will review your case and hopefully approve you. Would you like me to give you the web address where you can apply? It shouldn't take more than an hour to fill out the application. Again, we really want to serve the less fortunate in this way and not place any hindrances in the way of the gospel. Okay, so just out of curiosity, why don't you just have free services and cover your operating costs through the tithes and offerings? Wouldn't you reach more people that way? Oh yes, that's a question we get. And it comes from a big misunderstanding. You see, people won't value the teaching and ministry they receive if they haven't paid anything for it. For example, if you've paid $10 to hear a sermon, you're more likely to listen closely, take notes, and apply it to your life, right? Also, it's important to value the time and effort our leaders and staff put into each service. You know what they say, don't undervalue yourself or sell yourself short. And finally, God tells us to be wise in his word, to be like the ant that stores up provisions for the winter. In order for us to be sustainable, we need to make sure we charge a fair fee for our services. Who knows when people may stop giving enough for our operation costs? Who will pay the bills? We are just trying to be wise with the facility and ministry God has given us. It's all about sustainability. I'm not sure how much I need to unpack this satire, but I'll say this. We think this is cringy and laughable when it comes to the local church. But when it's a Bible translation organization, a publisher, or a biblical counselor, or some other parachurch ministry, we find most of it completely normal and maybe even applaud their enterprising efforts to make their ministry sustainable. But I'd suggest that it's simply not consistent and we should be striving to obliterate these kinds of things from the world of Bible translation rather than just turn a blind eye or encourage it like the majority are doing right now. Now, in this episode, we're going to unpack some real examples so that you can see that I'm not making these things up. But first, I want to start by highlighting and celebrating positive things that are a step in the right direction, which I see in the world of Bible translation. So here are some examples. First of all, SIL agreed to let our friend Angela publish her communicative Greek training videos as Creative Commons, which you can check out over at freegreek.online. 
Another great thing about SIL is that it publishes a lot of free software. It's easy to download without signing up or being blocked by a paywall. Software like Scripture App Builder, Reading App Builder, Hear This, and Keyman are some examples, and there are others. This is a huge blessing to the church and the mission of Bible translation. We also have organizations like Unfolding Word, who have a handful of resources directly tied to translation that are still under development but will be published as Creative Commons. And Sweet Publishing gives away all of their quality Bible images for free under one of the least restrictive Creative Commons licenses. United Bible Societies includes their translation handbooks in paratext for free if you are registered as part of an approved organization. Still a lot of friction there, but I'm thankful for it. Returning to SIL, they publish their translation journal freely and some of their academic work is available online for free if the author decides to make it available in a non-restrictive way. As we mentioned in a past episode, Biblica has been releasing many of its Bibles in different languages as Creative Commons over at open.bible. Of course, there probably are other efforts I'm unaware of, so please let me know if you think there are some important ones worth mentioning in future episodes. Now, before we go on, let's review real quick some of the things we've talked about so far in the journey. In the Dorian Principle book, which I will remind you is completely free and in the public domain, the author argues that ministry should be supported, not sold. I also want to remind everyone that the issue is not whether a worker is worthy of his food. We all are in agreement that you should not muzzle an ox while he treads the grain. That's obvious. We all need to eat and pay the bills, right? Of course, ministers of the gospel should have enough to eat and feed their children. That is not the issue. But what the Dorian principle is interested in is how we can honor Jesus' command in Matthew 10, 8 to give freely or give without pay while at the same time being able to pay the bills. One of the key issues to understand is that the worker is worthy to receive wages from the Lord of the harvest. That's totally different from charging the harvest itself money for our labor. So the biblical principle here is that our living should be provided for by God through his people freely supporting gospel ministry out of obligation and gratitude to God, not out of a sense of obligation to us. We just trust the Lord of the harvest to provide for us and do our work. That's our job. We must not say, maybe the Lord of the harvest won't pay me my wages and provide the food I need, so I will now charge people for the ministry work I do for him. Even worse, we should not say, the Lord of the harvest isn't giving me a high enough paycheck, so let me take the money he gives me and also require payment of the people he sent me to bless. Now, as we enter into examples of where Bible translation needs a Dorian Reformation, please, please understand that these examples involve people to whom I mean no disrespect. They are probably much smarter and more godly than I am. But my hope is that they and others will come to see the problems with what they are doing, not only as unbiblical, but simply as unstrategic hindrances for the mission of Bible translation. First up is Progress.Bible, which is a ministry of SIL International. Their stated purpose is, quote, gathering and sharing data to get the word of God into the hands of every person. So by their own definition, this definitely qualifies as something that directly attends to the proclamation of the gospel. So, first, there's a sign-up wall before you can see any of their public data. Once you sign up for an account with them, they tell you this, and I will quote, Want more data? Are you a Bible translation coordinator, strategist, or field worker? Our public website shares less than 10% of our overall data and insights for Bible translation. For $200 a year, You can have access to our full dashboard and reports to assist in critical decision-making. A limited number of partial and full grants are available for customers in Bible translation organizations who could benefit from the use of Progress Bible paid services. 
but do not have the resources to pay for the service. Contact us to find out more. End quote. So let me raise a simple question. Does this reflect urgency to eradicate Bible poverty to the point of casting off anything that hinders so that we can all run the race towards helping the bible without friction or obstacles? Does it reflect a wartime mentality? And does it reflect the radical generosity of the heart of Jesus shown in the very Bible they are trying to get into the hands of every tribe and every nation? Imagine for a moment that you're a donor who just gave $1,000 to SIL, and then you want to check on the progress of Bible translation, naturally. See what's happening with your money. And then you're confronted with this. How insulting. You have to apply for a scholarship to be able to look at some simple stats? So you head on over to the Ethnologue to see if that's any better, and you read the following on their plans and pricing page. Here we go. So here are the three main plans. Essentials. You get profiles on every language and country. $480 per year for one person only. The standard plan is our complete collection of profiles, maps, and digests for $2,400 per year for one person only. And then finally, Enterprise is a multi-user access plus options for system integration and contact them for a quote. So you may think that if you're a member of SIL, you get free access, or, or maybe even if you're a member of partner organizations like Seed Company and others. Well, that is not the case. So I will let you be the judge if all of this is a help or hindrance to the mission of Bible translation. Let's talk about another thing now, Training. Training is incredibly important to the mission of Bible translation, and so far there has been no training released publicly online. An initiative called the Digital Training Library was started a few years ago and so far has released several courses. Here's what they say on their website. The Digital Training Library, DTL, is an online learning platform designed to provide guidance, training, and knowledge to the Bible Translation Industries network of translation specialists to improve quality assurance for the entire Bible translation movement. The DTL curates excellent Bible translation training content for use by individuals and agencies across the globe. The aim of this effort is to improve translation efficiency and effectiveness throughout the industry worldwide. End quote. So far, there are three free courses, and the rest will cost $950 each. There's been talk of releasing the content as a free public repository, but so far nothing has appeared, and I have no idea how many sign-up walls or other permission walls you may ultimately have to jump through to be able to access the information. Now, an official certificate will only be available to those who have paid for the courses. There are scholarships available if you apply and are accepted. Meanwhile, the rest of the secular world is releasing incredibly rich, brilliant course content for free on YouTube, which is a platform that actually appeals to those who are from oral cultures. The YouTube platform costs nothing to host the content. So there are no overhead costs that you can complain about. Even MIT, listen to this, even MIT is releasing their courses for free with no sign-up required and under open licenses. Just Google MIT open courses and you'll see what I mean. So let me raise a simple question again. Which option would be more strategic? which reflects an urgency to eradicate Bible poverty to the point of casting off anything that hinders so that we can all run the race towards helping the bible without friction or obstacles, which most obviously reflects the radical generosity of the heart of Jesus shown in the very Bible they are trying to get into the hands of every tribe and every nation. The more strings you attach to things and the more hoops you make people jump through and the more friction and more bureaucracy and the more emails people have to send back and forth and the more approval you have to get to use something, the more stumbling blocks you put in the way of solving Bible poverty and the more stumbling blocks you put in the way of the marginalized global poor in the church. It's very simple. 
And I would suggest that this is one of the reasons that we never got even close to accomplishing Vision 2020. You know, when I started in Bible translation, there was all this talk about Vision 2020, which was we were going to have a translation of the Bible started in every language that needed one by 2020. Well, we missed that goal by about a thousand miles, and now we have a new vision, at least Wycliffe USA does, it's Vision 2025, that all languages that need a translation have a translation started by 2025. And we are simply not going to get there if we keep on putting stumbling blocks and friction in the way of our own stated goals. Let me give another very practical example. I recently read an announcement on the MAP Bible Translation Forum talking at length about this new 7,000 plus image resource for better understanding the Book of Kings. Basically, it's a collection of images of archaeological sites and artifacts that are connected with the Book of Kings in different ways and help interpreters and translators better understand the cultural context of the ancient Near East around the Book of Kings. Now, in light of the Dorian Principle, Let's listen to the copyright page on the website, BiblePlaces.com, and think about this. First of all, there's this paywall that is causing a ton of friction for most people. Now, you're granted a list of things with the purchase. Here's what you are not granted with the purchase. You cannot use the images in a book, magazine, or commercial product, or an online course, or redistribute the images or DVDs. And finally, you cannot include them on a non-personal image database. Then they have the audacity to say, our goal with this policy is to be fair and generous. Compare with many other companies that charge high fees per image, restrict use of an image to a single use, and restrict use of an image to a limited duration. So the main restriction that bothers me the most is that you can't use these images in an online course, and they cost $120. And these are simply images of ancient things that they don't own. It's basically tantamount to copywriting images of ancient manuscripts that have to do with the Bible. Now, this is immediately relevant to Bible translation first because you can't use these images in an online course, which limits the whole thing that we need to be doing right now is training more and more people to do good work. This also hits close to home because the translation team I'm working with is actually in the middle of the Book of Kings right now as we speak, and a suite of images like this might be helpful to them. But the friction of the cost and the bad taste it leaves in your mouth that you had to pay for something in such a petty way means that I will never use these images and neither will the translation team I'm working with. If they gave them away freely, and my translation team was blessed by them and their translation work, and they had a way for me to give to them freely as gratitude to God for their work, I might actually give them a donation of $200 or more. But you see, now that they have violated the Dorian principle, no one is blessed, and they receive no money. Honestly, I still can't imagine being a Christian and preferring to charge for ministry rather than bless more people. It really doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that if you put a paywall barrier in front of people, you'll inevitably bless less people than if the barrier were not there. It's just simple logic. It doesn't even take a deep dive into biblical exegesis to arrive at this conclusion. Now, here's another concrete example. I want to look at another specific case that's immediately relevant to Bible translation, and that's the Bible Project. They have an insanely wide reach. They're a powerhouse when it comes to influence in the evangelical world and biblical studies. And when I first heard about the Bible Project a few years ago, I was extremely excited and immediately signed up to support them because I genuinely believed that they had a more generous, open arms approach to ministry than most people because all their stuff was free without any friction or barriers or ads. You didn't even have to give your email address or sign up for something in exchange for watching their videos or hearing their podcast. By the way, I personally don't like most of their videos, but I love most of their podcast. So to this day, most of their early podcast episodes constitute some of the most valuable Christian teaching out there. But unfortunately, if you look a little closer or dig a little deeper under the surface at the spirit behind their project, you're going to find something that to me is ugly. 
If you go to BibleProject.com and click on Terms at the bottom of the page, it's kind of hidden, you'll find a ton of text. Let me read you some excerpts. I won't get into all of it because it's long. See if you hear the Spirit of Christ in this or the selfish, grabby, petty spirit of the world. You may not edit, modify, or make changes of any sort to any video content nor may you create any derivative works based upon the video content. You may not upload any video content to a new server or streaming service other than the ones we provide. While you are permitted to play our audio content on demand from our site or authorized services, you are not permitted under these terms to record, reproduce, rebroadcast, or make any other use of our audio content. Now, we criticize children for yelling mine about everything, but this takes that to a whole new level. We grown-ups have somehow managed to justify petty selfishness over things that God has given us and have already been paid for, not by ourselves, but by generous donors for the express reason of giving it away. So the Bible Project has over 20,000 donors giving regularly, giving millions of dollars a year to their organization. In other words, their bills are paid. They have food to eat. Is there any reason they can't give away their content without so many strings attached? So what this means is that anything that would be valuable for Bible translation that the Bible Project has produced is not free for me to adapt or incorporate in any way without their permission. If one of their videos were helpful for a Bible translation team working in Mexico to understand a concept or book of the Bible better, and it wasn't yet available in Spanish, I would not be legally allowed to translate and dub it for them. So once again, in a very practical way, their violation of the Dorian principle has caused less people to be blessed, like the translators I work with here in Mexico. And it just makes me wonder, why are we doing this to ourselves and one another in the body of Christ? Why do we bite and devour one another, as Paul says, over something that doesn't even belong to us? You know, at seminary, I had to write an entire paper about 1 Corinthians 4-7, which says, What do you have that you did not receive? If you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? And so that verse haunts me over and over and over in these discussions. There are many more specific examples of how Bible translation is hindered by violations of Jesus' command to give freely. But these tend to fall into a couple main categories, written publications and images slash video. So let's just go through a lightning round of some of these. One of my all-time favorite books on Bible translation, The Bible at Cultural Crossroads, costs $50 for the ebook version, and is published under the most restrictive copyright. Then, probably the best book on translation principles is also published under the most restrictive copyright by SIL and costs $45 for the paperback. On Amazon, the translator's handbook for the Book of Psalms by Bratcher and Rayburn costs, wait for it, $200 for the paperback, and is not available as an ebook through Amazon. It's also published under the most restrictive copyright. All the UBS translation handbooks are published this way. Another example is the Genesis handbook, which costs $111. Now let's talk about images. We've touched on BiblePlaces.com. Now let's talk about free Bible images. You would think that free, you know, Wow, what a step forward. My wife uses this site all the time to search for Bible images and illustrations for teaching Hebrew in our public domain video series. But the title is a bit misleading. Most of the images aren't really free from hindrances. They're hindered by all kinds of licensing issues slapped on them by the people who contribute to the site. Many, many of these images are published under a license that prohibits derivatives which makes it impossible for us to use them in teaching videos. The site specifically says, quote, you cannot use any images in video or film where the terms of download state no derivatives. 
Then we've got the Bible Translation Conference that happens every two years in Dallas. The last conference was held entirely online in October of 2021. If you head on over to btconference.org, you'd expect that the dozens upon dozens of papers and talks presented at that conference would be free for any missionary to download and learn from. Unfortunately, tragically, grievously, that is not the case. All the supposedly important research, work, and experience that went into making these presentations, done by volunteers, let me underscore that, volunteers, it costs $70 to access. Now, let me be clear, these presenters from all over the world prepared their talks for the edification of the BT movement. And then the BT conference executives took the information they freely gave and locked it down behind a paywall so that fewer people will benefit from it and the BT movement can limp along at a slower pace. Finally, we have the Institute for Biblical Languages and Translation over at iblt.ac. They state that they serve the worldwide Bible translation movement by training a new generation of full Bible translators and consultants. Their goal is to equip over 4,000 translators and consultants so that the full Bible can be made available in all languages by 2033. Once again, we find something highly unstrategic here, which does not follow the Dorian principle. How is this? because they don't give away any digital resources that they use and produce. And from all appearances, it's not because they need to sell their ministry in order to make ends meet. On their website, you can read their financial statements that show that they've spent half a million dollars on fundraising alone and received over $6 million in donations over the past three years. Their bills have been paid for by donors. I would suggest that with $2 million a year, their families aren't going hungry. And we know that they are actively developing digital training resources for teaching online, but zero of it is freely accessible, and I know of no plans to make it so in the future. In spite of donors graciously giving that much money, they still charge tuition fees upwards of twelve to $25,000 to learn Hebrew. Their full MA in classical Hebrew costs more than $33,000. It would be incredibly easy to bless the entire world with their digital material. On top of that, it would be the easiest thing for their world-class teachers to just press record on their Zoom classes and then post those videos on YouTube for hundreds of thousands of people to benefit from. It wouldn't cost them anything and they would lose nothing because their living is more than paid for by millions of dollars of donations. So without a biblical explanation for all of this, it gives the unintentional impression of greed. And that grieves me. Is that really the impression they want to give to the world? They say they want to train 4,000 people for Bible translation, but what if by following Jesus' command to give freely, they could actually train 40,000 in less time with less effort and at no further cost to donors? Now, obviously, I'm not coming at this from inside the organization, so I'm totally open to anyone from IBLT publicly clarifying why they don't release their content for free. I imagine they have a thousand seemingly logical reasons, but I wonder if those reasons are good enough to hamstring the growth of the Bible translation movement. In other words, are there really any reasons good enough to limit the millions of dollars donors are giving to only train 117 students per year who can somehow afford it or qualify for scholarships? Once again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, let me ask, Do IBLT and the BT Conference reflect a sense of urgency to eradicate Bible poverty to the point of casting off everything that hinders so that we can all run the race towards helping the Bibleists without friction or obstacles? Do they reflect a sense of strategy and innovation to take the incredible gift of the internet and use it to spread the knowledge God has given them to more people? Do they reflect the radical generosity of the heart of Jesus shown in the very Bible they want to equip people to translate? Or 
Do they reflect the petty spirit of the world, grasping at pennies when they have already been generously provided for by the sacrificial offerings of God's people? Donors give, expecting nothing in return. Shouldn't those receiving the donations do the same at a minimum? I believe that it's clear that God has presented the church with a gift and a test right now. Much like the master in Jesus' parables who tests the stewardship of his servants, the gift he has given us is the unprecedented ability in the digital age to spread knowledge and truth with virtually no limits. And the test is to see what we'll do with it, how we steward such amazing power. Will we use it to bless more people freely? Or will we create a false sense of scarcity and limit the potential blessing for the sake of monetary gain? Will we use this gift to spread the knowledge of the glory of the Lord over all the earth as the waters cover the sea? Or will we find clever ways of justifying our efforts to dam up the floodwaters and then only quench the thirst of those willing to pay or play by our rules? Now, to finish this up, I want to double down on this verse from Micah 3.11. I want to take out the microscope and meditate on it together for a bit. Let me read the context surrounding it. In verse 9, we start with this. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. And the mountain of the house a wooded height. So we have three parallel lines in this part of the prophetic poem. If we didn't have the first line in our day and age, we might mistake the second two lines as things that are okay. But the first line is something we still recognize in Christianity as something totally wrong. Bribery within the justice system is just obviously wrong to everyone, but the second two lines are not obviously wrong in our current climate and cultural moment within the church. So the second line is, priests teach for a price. That means that spiritual leaders are charging money for their teaching. Recognize that this is not just for basic presentations of the gospel, for preaching on Sunday morning. In context, this is teaching, and thus we would assume that it's teaching people about God, teaching people his law, about his character, his commandments, and what he's revealed so far in redemptive history. So this would be a way of saying that all theological education, whether it occurs within Sunday school, within Christian books, or at seminaries, is charged for by these teachers. It has a price tag, and yet this is equated with the act of taking a bribe as a judge or leader. I'll leave it to you and your own mind to take the application of this down the trail to what it means for seminaries and the Christian publishing industry. Now, the third line in this three-line parallelism couldn't be more clear in the Hebrew. This is clearly the act of telling fortunes for money, like the NIV says, or as the NET says, reading omens for pay, or as the NASB says, divining for money. This has to do at its root with some kind of pagan divination or witchcraft. So this is a double whammy. Not only are the prophets doing witchcraft, pagan divination, but they're doing it for money. Now, of course, in our current climate, this is happening all around us so much that we've grown quite used to it with all the Benny Hens of the world who are basically these kinds of false prophets who are practicing divination for money. So I don't know what kind of background you come from for people from my background seeing somebody in the church who calls themselves prophetic practice divination for money 
Well, that would be pretty horrific. And this is equated with religious leaders selling their teaching. You've just got to let that sink in for a moment. So if you're not offended immediately by prophets selling divination, then I think most people at least will be offended by leaders making decisions for a bribe. And this is also equated with religious leaders selling their teaching. In other words, the secular leaders of the nation have become corrupt, but not just them. The religious leaders have followed suit. They've walked in the footsteps of the world and all now are corrupt and have more interest in growing rich than in doing their jobs righteously. And as one commentator notes, their corruption is all the worse because it's hidden behind an appearance of piety. And I can't imagine anything worse than hiding this kind of thing behind an appearance of missions, of Bible translation. Again, I want to repeat that I'm not accusing anyone of intentionally acting in these kinds of nefarious ways within Bible translation, but I'm trying to highlight that this is what we will ultimately come across as if we continue down this path. So the question is, are we searching our own hearts? Are we actually paying attention to the words of Jesus to give freely? And are we willing to act upon this new knowledge and go against the status quo? I want to do my part in charitably making organizations aware of the image that they are showing to the world and to Christians and donors and everyone else. I know so many people in these kinds of organizations and institutions that I love and respect. And I know that most of them are well-meaning and are walking in the Spirit of Christ. So I want to simply and gently invite them, invite you, to apply the command to love your neighbor as yourself in this. Consider how you can remove hindrances and obstacles from the marginalized poor of the world who want to learn. Consider how you can make the mission of Bible translation race forward with greater efficacy and joy. I long for the day when unbelievers will say, I don't know much about Christians, but I do know that they're way more radically generous with their resources, their money, their time, their quote-unquote intellectual property than the whole rest of the world. That's my prayer. I think scripture itself gives a precedent of how it can go when you challenge people's attachment to worldly wealth and ways of amassing wealth. We have this example with the rich young ruler. He was given a hard assignment by Jesus, and when he received that hard assignment, he was deeply dismayed, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property, Mark 10, 22. Or as Matthew 19 says, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So, I fully expect that many people in Bible translation will listen to something like this podcast or read something like the Dorian Principle and say, yes, this is the right thing to do, but then they go away sorrowful because change is too hard. There's too much money at stake. You know, Bible translation brings in about $500 million a year, and there are so many systems in place that have made themselves part of the fabric of the organizations and their culture, systems which would need to be uprooted if they were to follow Jesus' command to freely give. It'll probably be too uncomfortable. Following Jesus is hard and deeply uncomfortable, especially when you have a ship that you've built up over decades to the point that it's too big to turn. The question remains, Is Bible translation just too big for reform now? I don't know the answer to that, but I sincerely hope that it's no. It's interesting that when Jesus entered the temple courts in Matthew 21, 12, he didn't have a nice friendly conversation or debate with those who were buying and selling there. He drove them out and overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. I think that may mean that some people may not have ears to hear a message like the Dorian Principle, and Jesus will just have to go straight for a violent wake-up call in their lives that may be painful and jarring. 
My hope and prayer is that Bible translation is not so full of money changers and sellers that the only way for change is for Jesus to resort to driving them out by force. So as we wrap this up, how can you help avoid this and help promote a freely giving reformation within Bible translation? An easy way is to spread this podcast series around to those who you know in Bible translation and churches and leaders who support Bible translation and have a vested interest in its health and success. It will cost nothing to take the time to do that. Another thing that costs nothing is to send copies of the Dorian Principle to those same people. Most leaders in Bible translation will never have these issues cross their minds unless they get recommendations from dozens of people. So go to the DorianPrinciple.org and order free copies and send them to people you know in Bible translation and with vested interests in Bible translation. Again, The copies are free, and the shipping is free. The audio version is free. The Kindle version is free. The PDF is free, and on and on. You don't have to sign up or give your email address or anything. Just click and go. Encourage people to think about these things in love. And most of all, pray for Bible translation regarding this. Whatever you do, don't just get angry or frustrated and sit around criticizing. That's our tendency, right? That will not promote reform. So be diligent to internalize the things we've talked about in this series and then speak the truth in love. Love.